Dr. Sharpak, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I feel very honored to be invited uh, to this uh, to, to be this conference. By various reasons, I am not a, I was not able to come, so I will deliver my talk uh, by this presentation, video presentation. Uh, the title of the talk is Transition of the Fetus to Newborn with the Risk of Prematurity. Of course, uh, the topic of this conference is uh, kangaroo care, and I have been very, uh, very interested in that. I haven't done so much research on this uh, myself, but as an editor of Acta Pediatrica, uh, I promoted the publication of a various a number of uh, papers on this topic, uh, uh, by Dr. Sharpak and others. To deal with this topic about uh, uh, the transition of the fetus to uh, preterm infant, I had to start with the fetus and uh, uh, discuss the, uh, what is it like to be a fetus. Can the fetus uh, be conscious? And compare that with uh, the uh, premi. So the fetus, as you know, is moving, breathing, uh, and uh, it's mainly asleep in active sleep or dream sleep. We don't know if the fetus is dreaming, but it's, uh, the EEG pattern is the same as during dream sleep in adults. Uh, and uh, it may be awake for short periods, at least the eyes are open, uh, and um, uh, I don't know if they are co it's conscious, but anyway, we know that the fetus now is very active and it perceives smell and tastes. We know that the fetus can smell t uh, from the 20th week. It likes uh, sweet tastes, uh, but grimaces when it is exposed to acid or bitter uh, tastes. Uh, it remembers good and bad tastes and smells. And a recent study has shown that the fetus seemed to uh, see, uh, or at least uh, the eyes are uh, closed, but if you uh, have it, uh, put a torch on the abdomen of the mother and uh, direct the light to the retina of the uh, fetus, uh, you can discover that it seems to um, um, see uh, that it uh, seems to uh, be aware uh, of, some, uh, of what it's seeing. And uh, Dr. Reisland and others in uh, Durham in UK, they exposed uh, the retina to a triangle like this. This is uh, how the fetus will see it. And what, what this corresponds to are the two eyes and the mouth of a human. Uh, but if uh, you show them a figure upside down, uh, like this, uh, it's not the uh, same, but it's not the uh, face. And the interesting thing is that the fetus seems to turn its head towards the, uh, this pattern, the face, but uh, not to this pattern. So uh, this indicates that already before you are born, you seem to uh, have an innate f uh, idea of uh, how a face looks like. Furthermore, uh, the fetus, we know that the fetus can hear and it can also uh, hear sounds and uh, rhymes and songs and rem seem to remember them uh, fairly well. And uh, we did a study together with Patricia Kuhl and uh, Christine Moon in Seattle and Stockholm. And we exposed the uh, newborn, newborn full-term infants to typical Swedish vowel, U, and a typical uh, English vowel, E. And uh, if we did that, Uh, so uh, uh, we, uh, the, feet, the baby is sucking, and when uh, the Swedish baby is hearing U, it sucks fairly regular. But when it hears E, which is little novel sound for it, he or she, 
uh, is sucks much more active. The American, like this, the American children, the, the opposite way, they seem to recognize E, which of course they had heard that quite a lot in the womb, but not U, which was a f foreign sound for them. So you seem to, and there are other studies showing that uh, uh, newborn infants uh, remember songs um, and jingles when uh, they are exposed to that during fetal life, life they seem to uh, recognize that even after birth. However, even if the fetus seem to uh, be aware or react to a lot of sensory stimulation, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, it's really conscious. It's mainly asleep. And even if it opens its eyes, it's not sure that it's conscious. And there's uh, certainly uh, a lot of indications that uh, the fetus is not conscious. It is, uh, uh, doesn't seem to be aware of sensory impressions. It's sedated by pregnenolone, adenosine, and prostaglandin. And uh, as I said, I don't think it wakes up. So all these uh, uh, reactions probably occur mainly during uh, active sleep. And furthermore, the fetus is living at a very low oxygen. Uh, so Joseph Barcroft coined the expression Mount Everest in utero because the oxygen level is about the same as at the top of Mount Everest. The fetus is weightless, limited gastrointestinal movements, uh, inhibited thermogenesis. Although it reacts to pain, I'm not quite sure it's conscious about pain. When the fetus is stressed, uh, it doesn't wake up like an adult and uh, being very active. An adult reacts by fight and fly, uh, uh, flight. I think the fetus, the first reaction is to stop movement. It seems to playing dead. And we can more talk about the freeze and dive because the fetus uh, react in the same way as a diving seal. So uh, uh, the blood is shunted to the uh, brain and um, uh, there's less, muscle, less uh, blood flow in the muscles and skin. But then, uh, a lot of, uh, then we have the transition at birth. And, and this is a, a, a remarkable metamorphosis. And for, uh, there's an emergence from an aquatic to a dry environment in a few hours, the change from a warm to a cool environment, and from a sterile to a microbial environment. And I think this is one of the most meta important metamorphoses, which hasn't really been considered as, uh, as it is, uh, how remarkable it is. And a few years ago, we found that there were uh, remarkable high levels of uh, stress hormones uh, catecholamines. So uh, this is the catecholamine level at a birth. Uh, in, uh, this is hundreds of babies uh, with normal or complicated deliveries. And compare that with an adult during rest or even an adult during stress, so sauna bath, and, uh, or a man during exercise, a woman during delivery. The levels are much higher, even compared with pheochromocytoma, which is a tumor releasing catecholamines, producing catecholamines. And uh, this stress of being born starts a few hours before birth during uh, cont uterine contractions. This is, scalp, uh, this is uh, fetal blood samples. And then we had to take scalp so blood samples, and then it's a search when the baby is born, and then it's leveling off. This is logarithmic scale. I think this is very important for the newborn baby. Uh, and it's not only an activation of the sympathoadrenal system, it's also an activation of the nordic system in the brain, the locus ceruleus. Uh, from where the northern and nordic neurons are spread out throughout the brain. And that wakes up the baby. So it's usually awake the first hour after birth and then it falls asleep. What about the, uh, the preterm infant? Certainly the full-term infant seems to be uh, 
conscious uh, and awake. I think the uh, preterm infants also uh, goes through the similar procedure of birth, and uh, although the stress is not so pronounced, but uh, it's a transition of uh, great importance. And uh, what is crucial is when uh, are the, is the brain mature for to being conscious? We think it's about 25 weeks gestation because then we can see the connections between uh, uh, the thalamus and the cortex. Before that, the, uh, the nerves, neurons from the sensory organs and other sources, they wait here in the subplate. Uh, and then after 23, 24, 25 weeks, they penetrate uh, uh, up to the uh, cortex and at full term uh, you have these connections. So before 25 weeks, I don't think you can say that the fetus, the, the uh, infant or the fetus can be conscious by an anatomical reasons. There are no connections if we believe that uh, consciousness is uh, localized in the cortex. If you look on a preterm infant about 25, 26 weeks, it seems to be uh, aware of the environment or conscious at a very low level or basic level. It's disturbed by when it, we irritate it or by pain. And uh, uh, we actually shown to uh, Dr. Bat, uh, Marco Batocci in our uh, host, uh, unit, uh, he showed that with near infrared spectroscopy that uh, when you um, uh, make an injection, uh, uh, when you just touch the arm, uh, there's a small reaction, but when you may perform a venipuncture, there's an increased uh, reaction in the cortex. So we know now that the preterm infants seems to react to pain at the cortical level, probably because it uh, may be aware of it. Uh, before that, we, we thought there was mainly a, a sub-cortical uh, um, uh, uh, event. Uh, recently, uh, Fabrice Valois in France uh, and others demonstrated that the brain of the preterm infant seems to be activated in the same way as uh, uh, children or adults. So uh, when you expose the uh, preterm infants uh, just to a standard tone or uh, phonemes or voices, father's voice or mother's voice, they seem to, the brain seems to act, be activated in a similar way uh, as later in life. So it's prepared to uh, receive the talk of, of the parents. <coughs> Another indication of being conscious is to express joy or hedonic feelings. And I think this 27, 28 old preterm infants expresses some joy. If we now uh, think of the, um, uh, pre the survival of the ex ex preterm infant, particularly extremely preterm infants, uh, we, we now uh, are able to uh, uh, take care of uh, preterm infants born after uh, 22 weeks. And in Sweden we have been very active, particularly in the northern part of Sweden. So, um, uh, uh, for example, after 24, 25 weeks, uh, uh, 26 weeks, about 80% survive. And I think most uh, neonatologists are agree that we should take care of them. But uh, 23 weeks uh, and, and tw uh, infants born of 22 weeks, they are at the borderline. And uh, in some parts of the world, including northern Sweden, there, there is a fairly high survival, up to 50 percent, otherwise it's about 20 percent. And uh, the reason why they survive, there are various causes, but of course uh, the improved respiratory care, corticosteroids and surfactants seem to be very important. We have about 9 million European children and teenagers who are born preterm. And this is of course 
uh, most of them, these children do very well and develop normally, but there are some who do not. And this is, is a big social problem. And uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, in the Epicure study, which is a little old now, uh, <coughs> they lo uh, looked on infants born 22, 20 weeks, eight weeks in England and Wales, and uh, f only 49% uh, survived without any handicap, while 25% uh, were severely disabled and 25%, 24% moderately disabled. And furthermore, uh, <coughs> Dieter Volken, Neil Marlowe demonstrated that uh, when preterm infants born before 32 weeks have a lower uh, IQ and it decreases um, a line, uh, in a linear way, so it's uh, about 70 at 23 weeks. We have actually been able to confirm this in the Swedish Express study. Maybe it's a little better, maybe something like this, but uh, it's still a big concern. Another concern uh, is the uh, uh, problem of autistic spectrum disorder uh, at six. Uh, uh, we have looked on children uh, born uh, before 27 weeks in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, and about 40% uh, had uh, uh, autistic spectrum disorder at six and a half years. Actually, 27% uh, when we screened them had abnormal social responsiveness scale. This may not be the same. Uh, the classical autism, they have a similar problem, similar symptoms, but uh, it's probably not a uh, genetic cause. Uh, as uh, when we th uh, look on autism in uh, full-term children. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, Leo Kanner, who uh, discovered, or is uh, an Asperger who discovered uh, autism, they, uh, he assumed that it was due to genuine lack of maternal warmth, warmth the refrigerator mother theory, which was absolutely wrong. And, uh, caused a lot of guilt among the parents, but uh, in some way I think it was an interesting uh, idea because maybe our extremely preterm infants suffer from being isolated in an incubator for a long uh, periods. And this has actually been demonstrated by Roberta Pineda in uh, St. Louis. She sh showed that infants who were isolated in private rooms with only uh, one uh, nurse and very little contact with the parents, uh, compared with infants who were exposed uh, to a lot of noise and uh, social stimulation in open ward. They, uh, these infants who were deprived of this stimulation uh, had delayed language and uh, uh, or you can also see on the temporal lobe how it's not well, as well developed as in um, uh, those infants who were more exposed. So I think it's a problem really that uh, uh, these extremely preterm infants are isolated in incubator. Uh, and um, uh, maybe we can talk about an incubator uh, hypothesis. However, uh, it, it's possible to do uh, interventions, and uh, uh, that's what we are working with now. And uh, uh, kangaroo care is a particularly uh, good way to stimulate uh, the development of the infant. And what are the mechanisms? We don't know exactly uh, why it seems to uh, make an improvement. But uh, of course, we have to consider the epigenetic effects first demonstrated by Michael Meany and uh, Moshe Swift, uh, showing that uh, uh, rat pups or, or mouse, mice, mouse pups who are stimulated, uh, they develop better uh, than those who are neglected. And you can also see that uh, on the genome, uh, the, Licking grooming seems to promote methylation of the genes, encoding for serotonin and corticosteroids. And uh, in our hospital, 
uh, Titus Slinsinger and Michael Norman has shown that uh, the epigenetic effects of being born by C-section uh, and uh, uh, that seems to affect the uh, uh, methylation uh, in the leukocytes and maybe this can be a co uh, explanation why allergy, diabetes and autism is more common among children delivered by C-section. So we have to think of uh, not only the genes but also uh, the other strand uh, the, uh, that uh, by epigenetic mechanisms we can actually change, uh, we, we can make changes in, in, of the, in the DNA uh, helix. Uh, NIDCAP was the first uh, successful intervention uh, developed by uh, Heidelis uh, uh, Als. Uh, I guess you are familiar with that, but uh, uh, the idea was to reduce the sound and light, uh, promote flex position, uh, try to create a fetal environment uh, and also help the parents to understand the signals of the infant. However, I think uh, that the kangaroo care uh, or skin-to-skin -skin care uh, may be uh, better because it's more active stimulation, while in NIDCAP you try to uh, um, uh, not disturb the baby too much. Uh, and um, uh, I think uh, kangaroo care can be, uh, is very promising. And in Sweden we also uh, promote the fathers to be uh, involved. So there are a number of studies uh, demonstrating uh, the importance of intervention uh, published by uh, Cochrane Library. And we have done this intervention uh, in uh, uh, Sweden. It's uh, Panilla uh, Hugosson uh, and Ulrika Odén. And uh, w they uh, teach the mothers to uh, sing, to sing for the babies, uh, nursery rhymes uh, and uh, the mothers are sitting with their infants uh, like this and uh, spend uh, several hours per day singing for the baby. We have also a control group where they are only sitting in kangaroo care but uh, uh, they can sing but uh, there's nothing, it's not a structured program uh, like this. So here is the mother. So what we did was to look on these babies uh, with a, a magnetoencephalogram and looked on how it affected the auditory cortex. And then we noticed that uh, those infants who had been exposed to singing, they had responded, uh, the um, auditory cortex response that was more pronounced for vowel, vowel duration, pitch and pitch. And to the left here in the middle you can see uh, those who, the silent group, those who were not exposed to singing. And then you can also, uh, there's a comparison with full term infants. So uh, it looks like this stimulation uh, of these preterm infants by singing seem to promote um, uh, the brain uh, activity. So uh, uh, we think that uh, by this uh, early intervention it's possible to uh, uh, promote the development of 
the infant, but of course we have to wait uh, uh, and see in the future if, uh, the long-term uh, effects. And that's it. And I want to now to thank all my collaborators and uh, particularly uh, Ulrika Odén, Professor Ulrika Odén, who has succeeded me uh, as the head of the uh, uh, unit, uh, uh, and then uh, Dr. Nelly pa uh, Padilla, who is actually from Bogota and will talk later during this meeting, and uh, Panilla Hugosson, and I also uh, some of the older work. Uh, uh, I also list uh, some of the collaborators at home and also abroad. Thank you.